I'm going to welcome on stage Alex, Alex Chung, who is, uh, who is also a serial entrepreneur, actually. I think you, you started quite young. Uh, how, how old were you for when you started uh, your first one? This is my 12th startup. 12th startup, all right. Yeah, so you started your career as an engineer at Intel, if I'm right, and, uh, and then among the startups you've created, there is, um, there is the Fridge, that is a private social network that was bought by Google, yeah. there is Artspace, a famous uh, e-commerce platform for contemporary arts, and uh, now there is a bunch of random ones that you'd, no one's ever heard of, <laughs> that have all failed. All right. <laughs> Giphy. And, and there is Giphy, so uh, I suppose everyone knows what a GIF is or not. I can explain. Yeah, raise your I hand can, if, you, if you don't know. We'll, we'll try to see. You don't know what it is. So I, am, I suppose you will have to explain first what, what a GIF is. Um, and then what is going to be important for us, so a GIF is a format for a light animation that we find everywhere on the internet these days. And they're mainly used for uh, humoristic purposes, right? Oh, so, no. no? no. <laughs> All right. You, you'll tell us more about that. Um, but you're going to tell us why uh, this, these little animations are, in fact, uh, an important matter and why they're yeah. actually something important for us and yeah, for the it's, internet. It's, it's important for the world, so <laughs> for everyone here. So this is, this, my name's Alex Chung. Um, I'm an engineer originally, but I also went to design school here at Parsons for graphic design. That's what brought me to New York um, from the West Coast. So a little bit about my company, because most of you don't know what Giphy is, but you probably will hear about it in the next year. So we, our company is a website, but we also have a platform. It's the largest platform for GIFs, which we'll explain in a second. But we serve about 150 million people use our products every month. And people don't, we're, the, we're in the top, I think we're the number 90th website in the world right now. You probably don't know that because we're still, we're still rising. Our API is integrated in Facebook, Twitter, Tinder, if, you've ever, if you're on Tinder and you've sent a GIF to flirt with people, that's coming from us. Uh, we're in Bumble, we're in Microsoft Outlook. So if you ever send an email to in the office and you're sending a GIF, that's coming from us. Uh, we're integrated, we have more reach than probably any other media company in the world. We also have, and no one knows about us yet, uh, except for our investors who are really smart to invest in us. We also have licenses with every, uh, every, pretty much every media company in the world, Disney, Lionsgate, Fox, to take all of these moments that have been made, turn them into GIFs, and then deliver them across the largest distribution network for, me I think it's one of the largest for media right now, um, based off our, off our reach. So, you know, what are GIFs? GIFs are basically just short, little, silent movie, movies or videos. And you think about that, and it doesn't really seem special, but it's, it's basically the same way that we've been using cinema for the last 100 years. If you look at cinema, every cut that is there is about five seconds, which is the same length as the average GIF. And so we, we've done analysis and we've seen that 80% of all the GIFs on our site are derived from movies and TV. So this is the basic building block of how we communicate visually with other people. So, I mean, if you think about the evolution from printing to cinema, GIFs are a way now to take those sentences from an actual video, take them out, and then share them with people. The technology wasn't there until about five years ago. And you know, we were the first GIF search engine. So you know, what does this mean? Like, what, why are these important? So if you, if you think about a still photo, you, know, uh, you take a picture of uh, a giraffe. And you can kind of get a sense of a giraffe, but you really need to see the giraffe moving in a video. But you don't, you don't want to watch the YouTube video because there's like a 30 second pre-roll. And you're like sitting there, and then you, then you go to another video, and there's like a 15 second pre-roll. But in a GIF, you can, kind of, you can see the motion and the, the, the awkwardness of a giraffe. So we, what, we've had, what we've seen is, in the very beginning, a lot of children coming to our site, trying to find... Um, an anecdote is, I was at South by Southwest, and a mother came to me and said... Uh, she had an autistic child, and she said, I love your website, thank you. My kids go to your site every day to learn what happy means, because there's no place on the Internet to know what hap how people express emotions on the Internet. And then that's the theory of, you know, that's kind of what we're actually doing, is GIFs aren't really about humorous things. I mean, they, everything starts out humorous. When you first learn English, you, you know, you, you smile and you nod and you do humorous things because that's the first emotion that people understand. Then you get more and more complex emotions like sadness, happiness. My parents still don't speak English, and most of the time they just smile and nod, which is what they tell you when you don't understand what's going on. And then once you learn the language, 
you, you see evolution of information and things get more complex. And so that's exactly the trend we've seen in the last uh, three years with how GIFs are being used. First starts out with funny cat GIFs, and then now it's going into more complex emotions. So this mother who was, had her autistic children seeing, she was like, yeah, there was no place else on the internet where we can actually see human expression in every possible type of happy. There are millions of types of happies if you think of all the movies that, that express happy, right? So what we're really doing and why GIFs are really interesting is Google was built to index the library and that's kind of what they did. And that was, there was no media, there was no social media, there was no human expression. It was very cold, it's very algorithmic, it's done by machines. But what about the rest of the college campus? What about the humanities? What about actual cinema? And what we're doing is building more of a humanist search engine that is indexing all of the human emotion and expression that has ever been done. So right now we have a process importing every movie that's ever been made, every TV show, every piece of information that's ever been encoded into a piece of moving image and classifying it under human expression emotion so that people can now express themselves with pieces of media from history and they can talk, they can show their children what happy was what, what, in the 30s, in the 40s. So photography just gives you a little sense of a snapshot in time, but life in humanity doesn't really work in photography. Like that's, life isn't still images, it's moving images. So what we really are doing is fundamentally changing the way that we're capturing humanity and recording it. We tried to translate all of this into black and white text in words, and that, was, that lasted us a pretty long time. We tried to capture it in cinema, but it's too long to get all of that in like an hour and a half, or if you're watching some French movies, like six hours long. But if you're, what we're doing is really capturing those moments into really short moments, and really classifying how, when we do think about the world, we're really encoding all of humanity and all of the world into these short segments. And now we have a way to search for them. And that's why you see this huge explosion of people wanting to to use our site and services because people really have a lot of things to say. They, they want to express themselves every day, but they can either write an entire novel to kind of describe one emotion, or they can try to make cinema, which is really hard, or they can just find these gifts that kind of give them the language of which to express how they feel. And we know, like, you know, that's why messaging is blowing up right now. Everyone wants to just talk. So we're basically just a bunch of people that want to talk to people and be heard. And gifts are a way to express and index everything in the, all of humanity into these short segments that can be shared with their friends. So if you thought photography as an invention was going to change the world because it captured humanity in some way, GIFs and the technology built around GIFs are going to do something way bigger because you, you, would, you would have to read entire novels in order to express happiness and Google will never show you that, but in a GIF you can express that in a few seconds. So the, the future is going to be really interesting. I mean, it was in Harry Potter, right? When they were looking at the newspaper, you saw all the newspapers moving. Like, the future is Harry Potter, where every still image will move to a moving image. We will express everything that we do, not in black and white, but in actual humans doing human expression. And so the world is going to be a much happier, more humanist place versus the cold place that we have right now. Uh, and that's why you should invest in our company, because we, <laughs> we, are the, we are the first and the only search engine that is indexing all of that so that in the future we'll be able to create the new literature, which won't be words uh, of the future. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for this very uh, inspirational speech. So who wants to ask the first question? Sure, you ready? Hi, Alex. Hey. First of all, congratulations. Um, can you speak a bit about your um, uh, six, um, or what you've learned across the 12 startups in terms of success and failure? So someone told me this a long time ago. If you look out New York, there are all these buildings. There's like a lot of buildings that don't even make sense. As a human society, as a, as a species, we are builders. Like you're either, we just want to make things for no reason. Like we want to bake cookies. We want to just do things for absolutely no reason but to make things. And if you embrace that, then you will always be making, and that's kind of what I've learned, is as soon as I realized that I was just someone that just liked to make whatever, then it became my art. And once it's your art, then you're passionate about it and you do it. If it becomes your job, then that's when you quit and then life sucks and then you don't want to do it anymore. So in, 
you know, people ask me, like, you know, how do you go through, like, after this company, uh, hopefully it's enough co company doesn't end, but after this company, I'll probably do another one. It's because it's about the art of building versus the, the journey versus the destination. So that's the biggest lesson that I learned is, is knowing that this isn't the end. This isn't the, having a good, a big company isn't the end. It's just the process of building things. And also work with your friends. Because if you're in engineering technology, most of the people really aren't that cool. And so you need to bring people in to hang out with them. I, I mean, I went to engineering school 20 years ago, and it was a lot of Asian people like me that didn't speak English. So I guess I was one of them. Yeah. Alex, um, can you say something about you? You're in Paris, oh, not in Paris, in France. You spend a year in Nice, right? Can you say something about just French people, French women, yeah, French so people. They say whatever you want about this. <laughs> yeah. I know you speak French as well, just yeah, so no, even if it's rusty, I'm sure you can say something. Uh, I studied French for 12 years. I went to the University of Nice. I lived in Paris. This was all about 20 years ago. Uh, I actually met a German and moved, <laughs> moved to Germany <laughs> in France. It, yeah, I know, it's a little over. And I, I actually always thought I would live in France because, um, you know, from, you can tell from my background, I'm, I'm very, I have a degree in philosophy as well, so I, I like the philosophy that comes out of France and the culture is something that's pretty unique around the world. And it was very inspirational when I was um, growing up and being educated. Like Sartre and like a lot of the French philosophers that came out were super motivational and, and spending time there, it was, it was like, um, I remember the moment that changes when I went to Paris one year and I saw the first Starbucks. And I'm from Seattle. Like, I've been growing up with Starbucks since I was a kid. I've been to the first Starbucks. And I saw Seattle slowly move into Paris. And then I was like, oh no, like this paradise that you guys had is now just Seattle. And so when I go there, it's now, now Paris is coming into Starbucks. And so it's, now it's being reverse like uh, colonized. So yeah, I've always had a big fond, uh, fondness for Paris. If someday if I ever met a French wife, I would move back, probably. I lived in Montmartre, too. Another personal or non-personal question? Hi. Um, you're in a very competitive market, or you will get to be very soon. How do you cope with other companies investing potentially more money than you are into technology? Because what would differentiate you from the others? Oh, so we, you know, we had a specific strategy. Let me tell you, this is actually, we had a very specific, I've done this for a while, we had a very specific strategy. And I only take it a year at a time. Another lesson I learned is no one to walk away from your startup. Because people will say, keep doing it forever, but there are really bad ideas that you should leave as soon as possible when you know it's not going to win. Uh, but we had a very specific strategy. You know, you, you say, we just raised, so you don't know, we raised uh, about $55 million in our last round. So we've raised about a total of about $75 million. And, why we and we had just raised about eight months ago, and people asked us, and we had all that money, people asked us, why did you do that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. We, one, we knew the economy was gonna go down in January, so we wanted to get to before there. But we also wanted to say to the market, anyone who wants to get into this game, you're gonna have to raise $75 million. That's a big bet. So that was there, but we also, from three years ago, the first thing we did was we owned all of the SEO around GIF. So if you search for GIF or GIFs, we are number one around any of that, any competitor that comes in, and that's just a branding play. Once you have a good brand, it's very hard. Brand will always beat anything. You know, like if you have a good brand and you focus a lot on your brand, it doesn't matter if people come in. You know, like Nike is Nike, but people have better shoes, but you still buy Nikes because of the brand. And then the second step we did was once we had the brand, we had ubiquity. So we are integrated, we did, you know, our deal with Facebook took three years. You know, that's a slow grind. And this is personal relationships from like 20 years ago of people that I know. And so we built the piping that is really hard to take out. So if you have the brand and then you have all of the relationships and all of the content and the distribution, that ends up becoming really, really hard. But ultimately it comes down to the product. We hired the best product people in the world. And like literally the world, it's like the best engineers that were at Tumblr, at Foursquare. And anyone who tries to copy us, we are just two years ahead of them. So ultimately, I think what you're saying is defensibility. I think the big things are brand. If you have a brand, then your product doesn't have to be that awesome. People still, I mean, think about all the American cars out there. People still buy them when they kind of suck. Uh, and then the second part is 
its brand, and then just being better. And if you're not better, then you have no, no reason to be there. You have to rely on your brand, but that doesn't last too long if you suck. It's more like a practical question that I have. You, I didn't know the gifts before you mentioned it today. Yes. And I was wondering when you said that you are capturing like happiness in a film or in a photo or in a, in a video or whatever. But how do you make sure that what you consider as happiness is what happiness is in other part of the world? Do you standardize? How, what, what standards are you using? Yeah, no, that's an that's a interesting question. Um, Alex, there was a project uh, at the New Museum where they did this, uh, I forgot who the people were involved now, but they did an analysis of Google Images across multiple, uh, multiple locales and countries. And they did a search for happy on Google Images. And they found that Google Images was super racist and sexist because when you did, you know, you said happy, there were like women working in the kitchen and men working in suits at business. And it was, it was this weird thing. So what we, so we're sensitive to this, and I think all of, most of our content is coming from popular culture. So we're relying right now, we, we're indexing most of the US culture. So we're deriving this from what Hollywood thinks is happy. So it, it's derivative of our popular media. And if people are searching for happy and they're finding happy in the US, all of the other ones that aren't ever viewed will kind of fall out. So it's a very democratic way to find what happiness is. We aren't really focusing on the rest of the world. When we do that, we'll, you know, when we go to Europe, we'll find French locals to kind of define that. But it is a very kind of existential problem that you're talking about. You know, how do we define any of these things? It's very relative to who you are. Um, but because there's search, you can find your version of happiness. And because someone somewhere will, or you can create it because we just launched a bunch of creation tools. So you can, you can populate, you have the right to populate the database and the library with your definition, if that makes sense. But yeah, that's always going to be a problem on uh, global definitions of, of emotions and expressions. Hi again. Can you speak a bit about your revenue streams? Yeah, zero. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah, if you're in entrepreneur school, uh, don't ever say that. <laughs> But it's, a, it's zero right now, but we have exponential growth right now. So it would actually be, I mean, if you're uh, from practical industry, you do like four or five times your revenue. Why would you ever want to make revenue until your growth stops? If we started pricing our revenue right now, people would start pricing our company at a much lower valuation than we would be in about a year. We just doubled all of our traffic in the last <laughs> two months. So we're kind of waiting for this, this peak. And once we start cresting, we'll start pricing what we can be done. Uh, we do about a billion page views a month. We serve about a billion gifts a month, um, way more than that actually right now. So if we turned on banner ads on our site, we would make 20 plus million. We would be cash flow positive, be done. But if you think about Google, Google did something, when we did something Google didn't do, no one searches for expression on Google. When is the last time you searched for sad on Google and used it in anything? But half of our searches are human expression on our site. Like, Google is not doing this, yet they're monetizing on all of the referential data in the world. But we did an analysis of Google, and 90% of all Google searches are about culture and, hu and hum human culture and, human ex and um, like celebrities, movies, TVs. So if you imagine if we take 1%, 0.1% of Google traffic, we just, our business model is basically we just ripped off what Google's business plan was in the 90s, and we just put our name on it and said, this is what we're going to do, but we're going to do it with GIFs, which are, High, way more performant than, than HREFs and text, and they can be branded. So we're gonna have a multiple on that. So that's kind of our revenue stream. And all our investors are like, oh yeah. And you know, uh, another thing that we kind of don't talk about, but because we are the largest distributor of media in the world, think about all the banner ads you see in the world. We serve you know, a billion a day of these. We know what's, being popu what's popular right now, so when you see, uh, a sports gif being popular, we can, or let's say Game of Thrones, we do all the gifts for Game of Thrones. We know what characters, like Jon Snow is really popular right now. We can go back to HBO and say, this is popular right now. Do you want to click this button and pay us a lot of money and we will distribute this across every ad network, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Tumblr Tinder. No one else can do that, right? So we would, in, when we want to, we will be the largest distributor of ad network uh, 
distributive mobile ads and banner ads in the world? The last question. I'm going to try not to get too philosophical on you, but you mentioned the art of building. I would interpret that to be taking something and improving on it versus the art of creating, which is just inventing something from scratch, again, based on my interpretation. So for a first time uh, entrepreneur, someone just starting out, uh, recognizing that you have 12 or that you've done this 12 times, what would you suggest to someone just starting out their entrepreneurial career? Building on something that's already out there that's not necessarily good, or creating, identifying a gap and filling it? So uh, that's a good question. The, being first at anything is almost impossible. It's like you get those like once or twice <coughs> in a lifetime to be really unique. Usually, I mean, even Einstein, when he was creating the theory of relativity, there were like six other people doing it at the exact same time. If you have an idea, I guarantee you there's a bunch of Y Combinator people that are already doing it, and it's like they're crazy. They just sit in the basement drinking Red Bull, and like, they're, like you will have competition. So it's really not... I think if you're starting and learning, it's just like the act of learning. You have to copy, like you copy and replicate. So my first few startups were all about just ripping people off. Because like if I can du duplicate it and be number two, like I don't need to be McDonald's, I can be Burger King. Like do I need to be Uber? Lyft still makes billions of dollars. You know, you learn from that and you learn all the mistakes without taking the major risk. And then you wait for the opportunity when you see and you have the skills enough so uh, to, to do something new. So I'll, I'll tell you my social network. I built that in 2003 for college. I had 500 of my friends on it. We had photos, videos, everything. This was before Friendster, before MySpace. It was actually better than MySpace, but I didn't know, I, didn't, I was like 17. I had no clue that you could actually make money doing this or that it was even a thing. I wasn't ready. And then when I saw it happen, I was like, oh, this is cool. I get it. And then I followed it. And then over the years, I kind of perfected it. And then 10, 15 years later, I did it again because there was a market. And I said, OK, Facebook isn't doing this. I'm going to do this. So in short, I would say copy everyone. It's totally cool copying. The best artists in the world spend all their lives copying first. And then once your skills are complete, then you wait for the opportunity when you can be unique. But there is really nothing. You know, you can't, it's almost impossible to be original, right? So if you see that, then you should do it and don't tell anyone about it. And then you should come see me so that we can invest in your company. Thank you very much.